The evolution of Deadpool's existence on the silver screen has been nothing short of astonishing to watch. From his early bastardization to the doldrums of development hell to now being an international cultural phenomenon with video games, merch, and a trilogy all his own, Ryan Reynolds has seemingly done the impossible and through sheer tyranny of will been able to reclaim the Merc with the Mouth's dignity. Dad? Somewhat. It's amazing to think that this almost didn't happen simply because Fox thought it was a great idea to completely butcher the character in the abysmal X-Men Origins Wolverine. For a decade and a half, this represented the only on-screen collaboration of the two intrinsically connected characters. That is until now. Whiskey dick of the claws. It's quite common in Wolverines over 40. To say Deadpool and Wolverine is one of the most anticipated films of the century would be like saying Kathleen Kennedy has a mild distaste for men. But is it able to match all the hype and save the MCU? Or will Disney's current record for live action flops continue to push the company toward the eventual Elon Musk hostile takeover? Go f yourself. Picking up at some point in some timeline, honestly it's really fucking hard to keep track anymore. We join Deadpool as he does the exact thing everyone was expecting him to do. Desecrating the corpse of Logan to the tune of Bye Bye Bye. I fucking knew it! By the way, nice X2 callback. Following this, we have the standard flashback of how we got here, which has become one of the most overused tropes in recent history. Wade Wilson is in a deep depression. With seemingly little direction in life and feeling like he doesn't matter, he is seen attempting to join the Avengers. After being turned down by Happy Hogan, of all people... <laughs> Man... You are one pathetic loser. He does the next closest thing to working for a Disney subsidiary, becoming a used car salesman. Same thing. Not really, but it's something. <laughs> working along with Peter from the second film, he has carved out an extremely mediocre lifestyle, leaving him incredibly unfulfilled. It's around this time he's selected by the TVA to be removed from his universe before it gets eradicated. You see, as it turns out, Logan from the Fox universe was actually the anchor being which held the whole damn thing together. When he was killed off and Hugh Jackman was no longer employed by them, it fell to shit and was essentially worthless. Which is about as on-the-nose commentary as you can get about the Fox X-Men franchise. Returning back to the beginning of the film, the failed attempt to recover the real Logan has forced Deadpool to alter his strategy. Deciding that pretty much any Logan from any universe will do, he proceeds to go on a multiversal travel montage in order to find one too drunk to resist. Seeing as how he refused to go along with the plan, the TVA immediately deem him persona non grata and prune him along with the displaced Wolverine, sending them to the Void, which is controlled by Cassandra Nova, the unborn twin of Charles Xavier. Ruling the Void with an iron fist, she has assembled a legion of nearly forgotten minor characters from dead franchises to maintain order within her realm. Seeking to escape, Deadpool and Wolverine venture deeper and deeper into the Void, encountering every single possible bit of fan service along the way. But will they be able to get out and save Deadpool's world? And just how many fucking Easter eggs can we fit into one film? Seriously. Turns out the answer is a metric fuck ton. As you can tell from the incredibly brief description, this film doesn't exactly have the deepest plot of all time. Honestly, I'd liken it to porn, where the story is really only an excuse to get to the physical stuff. And in the end, that's all this was ever gonna be. A giant self-aware circle jerk for the fans. If you can go in understanding this, it becomes far more enjoyable. The very definition of mindless fun. A series of rapid-fire jokes, visual gags, nostalgia, and zero semblance of story structure. Heh. <laughs> At this point, it's pretty safe to say that Ryan Reynolds has the job as Deadpool for as long as he fucking wants. There has never been a character more tailor-made for a particular actor. He has taken what was once a relatively obscure character that only comic book nerds could pick out of a lineup and made him into a household name. Made doubly impressive when you consider that he did it in three R-rated films. Though going based on the amount of small children in my theater, you'd have thought otherwise. Good on you, negligent divorced dads whose weekend happened to line up with the release. With this outing, he really cranked his not giving a shit meter up to 11 and truly takes the piss out of everything he can, himself included. I've no more fucks to give. Though sometimes I do get the sense that certain topics were off limits from the powers that be. Most of his jokes land and after three films you'd think the act would wear thin, but somehow it doesn't. Pelvis to pelvis. Let's go tip to tip. There we go. The kids call this docking. For 25 years, nothing in life was certain except for death, taxes, and Hugh Jackman playing Wolverine. If Ryan Reynolds has officially solidified himself as the definitive Deadpool, I'm not even sure a term exists to sum up how synonymous Jackman and Wolverine truly are. It really seemed that with his exit in Logan, an era had ended. But as with any true artiste, it just required that the right project come along to spark the creative juices. Oh, and a big bag of cold, hard cash. We're not just doing this for money. We're doing it for a shitload of money. As for Hugh's performance, he hasn't missed a beat and clearly put in the work to get back into as good a shape as he possibly could. And I'll be damned if it wasn't cathartic to finally see Wolverine be the best at what he does. Which isn't pretty, by the way.
I for one am glad that he agreed to do this role because despite enjoying Logan, I never felt that it wrapped up everything I wanted to see in this character. And the fanboy in me was always bitter that we never got to see the iconic suit. Well, not only do they make up for that here, they go the extra mile by giving us a ton of other versions of Wolverine. Variants ranging from his Incredible Hulk 181 debut to the Age of Apocalypse to Old Man Logan and even some super obscure ones. If Reynolds and Jackman were literally the only two people in the entire film, I think it would still work due to their chemistry. But as you're probably aware, there are way more people who show up. I'm going to give another warning as mentioning some of the other characters may be considered spoilers, so proceed with caution. In a post-Endgame world, we found ourselves in the unfortunate cycle of key jangling and cameos. Some good ones, such as... And others, well... But those are a mere drop in the bucket compared to this. Bringing back actors like Ray Park and Tyler Mayne from the Fox X-Men universe is one thing, but to revive Wesley Snipes and Jennifer Gardner as Blade and Elektra respectively is a sight to behold. Hell, even Channing Tatum finally gets to play Gambit and quite possibly the greatest in-joke I've ever seen play out on screen. Trust me, his dialogue captures the whole debacle of his unmade film perfectly. And it doesn't end there. From one as big as Chris Evans reprising his role as the Human Torch to tiny bits like Azazel from X-Men First Class. You can't look anywhere on screen without being eye-fucked by callbacks to older Marvel projects. That all being said, I think the most fitting reprisal was that of Daphne Keene as X-23, an actress who's making her fourth consecutive appearance on this channel. However, despite having only 10 minutes of screen time, she separates herself from the pack by having some of the more hard-hitting dialogue that is very well delivered. This further proves that Leslie Headland and her hack word assemblers are simply the worst, as it's obvious this chick has some acting chops. If I had to choose a weak point in the cast, I'd have to give that dubious title to Emma Corrin as Cassandra Nova. Throughout the whole film, I never bought her as a viable threat, which is actually not exclusive to this chapter of the Deadpool saga. It's been a series-long struggle to establish a solid, convincing antagonist. This is often overshadowed by the comedic nature, but using that as a crutch does not negate the failings of a compelling villain. Even with the underwhelming antagonistic presence, I can honestly say that this was a fitting send-off for many characters and actors who never got a chance to say goodbye to certain roles in their careers. Goodbye! Okay, I'm good. Or in the case of Channing Tatum, one he never even got to do in the first place. Pacing on this one is a strange bird indeed. Clocking in at just over two hours, it isn't even close to being too long. It would have benefited if they had added 15 minutes to the total, considering how much random stuff they tried to cram into it. And no, that's not an anal joke. It's like he was giving birth anally, but they quit halfway through. By the time you get to the third act, you've effectively seen the swan song of the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, Blade, and Elektra. This all makes the narrative feel incredibly bogged down by character movement, giving it a sense of having two or even three scripts worth of ideas in one film. This leaves me in one of the strangest places I've ever been in my movie review life, wishing this was a two-parter. I never thought I'd come out of a film pining for a cliffhanger, but I guess there's a first time for everything. All I can say is there's likely to be one hell of a director's cut, and it will be one that people are actually going to be excited over. Go fuck yourself, Zack Snyder. From a plot perspective, this one isn't going to be lighting the world on fire with its deep, compelling narrative. And the same can be said about its production value. It's your typical overly produced CGI-heavy standard MCU fabrication relying on adding and changing things in post. This once again leaves Marvel with a significant chunk of change to make up for. With a reported budget of $200 million and another 100 to 200 in marketing, this will have to make anywhere from 750 to 800 million to start seeing a profit. I am Marvel Jesus. No, not that kind of profit. I know what you're thinking. This is the part where I predict that it will end up being a huge flop for the near unreachable number. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. I actually think this has a chance to smash that figure. As I pulled up to my theater, I was met with an incredibly welcoming sight. Something I hadn't seen in years. A full parking lot. Holy shit! My auditorium was packed, as were several others, and the line for concessions was wrapped around the lobby. For the first time in a long time, I felt like an MCU film was an event. And I can foresee Deadpool fanboys seeing this multiple times. Hell, I might be in for a second go, just to see if I missed any cameos. So does Deadpool and Wolverine match the hype? I'd say so. Is it a perfect film that will be selected by the National Film Preservation Foundation? Absolutely not. As a narrative, it's extremely simple and safe, relying heavily on its abundance of cameos to carry the bulk of the weight. It has the distinction of being both incredibly enjoyable and structurally bad at the same time. But truthfully, that's okay. It never sets out to be this year's Oppenheimer or some deep, meaningful chronicle which changes the zeitgeist. It doesn't even try to push an agenda. All it does is seek to entertain, a goal it accomplishes by the mere act of being fun. It's a B12 shot in the MCU's ass. A boost that will make everyone feel better temporarily, but doesn't address the underlying cause of all the issues. It's Kevin Feige. It's always been Kevin Feige. 
If there's one huge complaint I have, it's that they really should have used this as an excuse to finally kill the multiverse. They even sort of hint that this is going to happen and then simply don't. Which seems like a huge missed opportunity to course correct. But other than that, most of the shortcomings are easily ignored in favor of fun. And if that's not enough to convince you that you're allowed to like bad things, I'm not sure anything I could possibly say would do the trick.